Greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on YouTube. That's right, the Designing Hollywood podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it, especially if you love the movies? Observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, in design, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your sommelier of sci-fi and cinema, your evangelist of the imagination, and of course, your existential Mr. Rogers. That's right, me, Robert Meyer Burnett, and call me whatever other nicknames you want to hang on me. Remember, I don't make those nicknames up. You do. Anyway, today, Saturday, October 8th, it's Rob's Observations episode number 809, and ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, gentle beings, kind souls, however you choose to identify across these, the 28 known galaxies. The New York Comic Con, literally three minutes ago, the Star Trek Universe panel concluded, and not uh, less than a half an hour ago, Paramount Plus dropped the first, we had a teaser trailer for Star Trek Picard Season 3, now we have a full trailer for Picard Season 3, and we have shocking, shocking, I say, revelations. Here is, of course, showrunner Terry Metalis in a photo he tweeted out moments ago with the other principal cast besides Patrick Stewart himself, the principal cast of Star Trek Picard Season 3. we got LeVar Burton, Rena Sirtis, Michael Dorn, Jonathan Frakes, Gates McFadden, or Cheryl Gates McFadden, and, of course, Brent Spiner, who comes back playing... Uh, I guess it's lore. Very exciting, folks. Very exciting. Now, you've heard me singing the praises of Star Trek Picard Season 3 for, I don't know, four or five months now. Uh, I've had to be very cagey about it, very sort of, you know, maybe I saw it twice, the entire 10, ep 10 episodes. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I just read scripts. Maybe I looked at storyboards. You know, I can't say. No man can say. Uh, let's just say I've been a, a staunch supporter of Picard Season 3 after hating, hating. Uh, you know, I've hated all four seasons of Star Trek Discovery, and I've hated the first two seasons of Star Trek Picard. It gives me no pleasure. Star Trek is my favorite franchise. As I've said, the Star Trek hostage crisis has continued on, has been going on since 2009 and Bad Robot's three Star Trek movies. Then it was taken over by Secret Hideout, which is just an adjunct of Bad Robot. I mean, those Bad Robot guys, they're everywhere. Lords, uh, uh, Rings of Power, Star Trek, come on. What's going on in Hollywood, man? Anyway, Terry Metalis, who, yes, worked on Star Trek Picard Season 2. Terry Metalis was a showrunner of the series adaptation of Terry Gilliam's 12 Monkeys, a terrific show if you've never seen it. He also did work on a few episodes. He was a co-showrunner on Picard Season 2, but a lot of those decisions were already made, although he did write one of the best episodes of that season. Terry also started off on Star Trek working for Brandon Brog on Star Trek Voyager. He also worked on Star Trek Enterprise. So he's got the Roddenberry DNA uh, in him. Now, a lot of people, they don't believe me. They haven't believed me. And, uh, well, a new trailer dropped today, and we're going to talk about it. We're going to analyze it. So if you haven't watched the trailer, Paramount Plus dropped it. It's on YouTube right now. Go look at it. Go look at it and come back here and join the conversation. And uh, if you want to fire in tips or super chats, you can speak how you want to speak. I've got right there, my co-host of Midnight Musing. She is actually at the New York Comic Con. She was at the Star Trek Universe panel. She says, hi, Robert and PGS family. Just came out of the Star Trek panel at New York Comic Con, and it was incredible to see the full TNG cast again. Felt like old times. Was moved by the panel Picard season three will give us all what we are longing for. Um, that is certainly true. Uh, as I've said before, 
Uh, Terry, who he's been a member for 19 months. Terry, all the way in Norway. Kevin Rubio says, I believe you, Rob. Well, thank you, Kevin. Everyone's doubted me. Look, I've become a Star Trek pariah. People are like, oh, Rob. I mean, even Terry Metalis jokes on Twitter that I'm a paid shill. Uh, I'm waiting. I've said I'm an easy lay. If you want to make me a paid shill, Paramount, I've worked for CBS for three years working on the Star Trek Blu-rays. I, I've done a lot of things. Um, so, you know, what can I say? People are, I'm getting texts. Holy shit, man. Amanda Plummer, Moriarty and Lore. I'm telling you, Star Trek Picard season three, it, what it's like, it's like a 10 hour next generation movie set 30 years after TNG. Uh, and I loved it. I mean, of course, if I've seen it, maybe I've seen the whole series twice. Maybe not. Can't say. All I can tell you is that I've been singing its praises for good reason. Now, let's let's do a deep dive into the trailer and see what we have. First of all, let's get the big elephant out of the room. That's right. That is, in fact, the Enterprise E. Or, pardon me, the Enterprise F. The Enterprise E, we know what the Enterprise E is. The Enterprise, well, we, we know what the Enterprise E was, maybe. Who knows? But this is the Enterprise NCC-1701F from Star Trek Online. Yes, Ladies and gentlemen, it's in the trailer. Uh, I can confirm the Enterprise F does, in fact, make an appearance. As we know, it's in the trailer. Why wouldn't you think it does? Um, and it's glorious. It's beautiful. It might have, um, you know, even, even. let's see, there's, um, I just, I realized I forgot to pick up something. But yeah, so the Enterprise F from Star Trek Online, making, interestingly enough for you canonistas, and I know that you all are canonistas, right? You're all thinking to yourself, uh, well, those of you who don't play Star Trek Online, but is Star Trek Online canon? Well, the lines are blurred, folks. The lines are blurred. Are they canon? Looks like it is to me. And, um, you know, what's really interesting is that uh, I can neither confirm nor deny um, anything. But uh, I can't, I can't. But maybe, and you also saw this in the trailer, the Enterprise F uh, might, might, it just might have. And I, I don't mean to, you know, I'll stop with the caginess after this, I promise. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to pull up a, a, a file here to show you. The, the Enterprise F may or may not um, have emerged. I mean, it may have, I don't know. Can I say, who knows whether it did or not. But it may have emerged, and we saw this also in the trailer, uh, from the new and improved space dock, ladies and gentlemen. Obviously, this is very redolent of the space dock first introduced in Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock, although it is much bigger. And look at that. Are th is that fireworks? And are those a bunch of ships around space dock? I don't know. You know, who knows? I don't know. Uh, and, and if I did know, I wouldn't say. Anyway, um... It's all very exciting. As a Star Trek fan, I'm very, very excited about this. Now, of course, we, we had some really interesting people, big revelations. Amanda Plummer, honey bunny herself, Quentin Tarantino's Amanda Plummer. Uh, I, I guess I can say she is, in fact, up to no good. Who is she? What is she? How is she? Why is she? If you had Drax from the Guardians of the Galaxy here, not going to tell you, but... Uh, as you can see from her performance, her, the snippets of it in the trailer, ask her if she's having a good time. She probably would say, why, yes, I am, in fact, having a good time. There she is. She is chewing the scenery. It is fantastic. Uh, and I, I, for one, am there for her in every way, shape, and form that you can be. Now, we've also seen there's a new, it looks like, an enemy spacecraft and here's the enemy, enemy spacecraft approaching a nebula. This is all of this, is, by the way, from the trailer. I didn't steal any of these images. I just took them off from the trailer. Uh, this ship is known as the Shrike, from what I understand. And um, there's a close-up of it, also from the trailer, with its talons. I guess that's where it gets its name from, the Shrike, um, bird of prey kind of a thing. So there it is in space. Who knows where it comes from? Who knows? I don't know. But, um, yeah. I mean, pretty neat. I don't know where that nebula is. And of course, uh, as all Star Trek villains are wont to do, they are menacing in the view screen. Talking to you through a view screen, I mean, it's it's a, it's a time-worn trope all the way back to the first season of the original series. you got to love it. 
But does, like, Khan Noonien sing before her? Does she never meet Picard? I don't know. You'll have to watch and tune in and find out. Because, you know, in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, Khan and Kirk never meet. So is this one of those situations? Who knows? Um, but obviously, if you like Amanda Plummer, as I do, um, come on. Amanda, are you excited? Go down in the comments below and tell me. Do you want to see Amanda Plummer wreck some shop? Because I bet it would be fun. You know, Amanda Plummer's an interesting actress because she's been popping up over the years in really interesting places, um, in episodics, in movies, um, and I've always liked her. She, She's clearly unhinged in this, and I'm so there for it, which, um, you know, how, how, how can you not, how can you not love that? Um, uh, I, I did. I mean, I, I think she, she looks great, and... Um, Hey, now another, another very surprising, um, another very surprising, um, uh, revelation of this trailer, which I was surprised by is professor Moriarty himself, who appeared in two episodes of TNG played by Daniel Davis, the great actor, Daniel Davis, uh, looking a little older. Obviously, he was in movies like Hunt for Red October, but he played, uh, he was in uh, Elementary Dear Data, and he was also in Ship in a Bottle. Elementary Dear Data was, of course, the second season Next Generation episode that was directed by Rob Bowman. And he shows up in the trailer. <laughs> wow. Let me just say, there is nobody, and I can say this, I can say this actually without giving anything away, but I can make this, as, this is a true statement. No one who are currently who is currently working on any show. I mean, if Mike McMahon was making a live action Star Trek, and maybe he'll show up in Lower Decks, but Terry Metalis, only person working on live action Star Trek that would bring back Professor Moriarty uh, in whatever way he's brought him back. Clearly, he's back somehow. I don't know. If I did, I wouldn't say. But um, uh, how cool is that? And got back the actor. I can only imagine. I can only imagine that people probably looked at Terry Metalis and said, "Wait a minute, you want to bring back who?" Who? Ah. But apparently, according to this trailer, he did. Pretty exciting. And then another, another shocking revelation, or not so shocking. Here is Brent Spiner, clearly playing what looks to be, look at that scowl, lore. But it, this looks like a data that would be Brent Spiner's own age, or a lore, an, a Sung android. And lore, obviously, is back and pissed off. Why? Don't know. Wouldn't tell you if I did. Uh, but there he is. Lore is back. What does he want? Why is he back? How is he back? Where did he come from? These are all mysteries to be unraveled in the 10 episode Star Trek Picard season three that comes out. Wait, when does it come out? That's right. It comes out February 16th, ladies and gentlemen, February 16th. Uh, very, very exciting. Of course, one of my favorite moments in the trailer is a uh, Worf says that he is a pacifist now. He's a pacifist. A great great line in the trailer. He explains he's a pacifist as he and Riker are beaming somewhere. And Riker says, we're all going to die. Um, why is Worf a pa pacifist? Why? Now, I, I want to point out that Worf has a Klingon weapon on his back. And if you look at the costume that he's wearing, that is not traditional Klingon armor. Um, maybe is it is it civilian garb? Is Worf, does he belong to a certain organization that has something? I don't know, wouldn't tell you. But I can tell you that that weapon that Worf has on his back was actually designed by visual effects supervisor Dan Curry. Dan Curry was one of the two visual effects supervisors on Star Trek The Next Generation, and he was the man who actually designed the Batleth. And showrunner Terry Metalis went back to him and asked him to design a new Klingon weapon for Star Trek Picard Season 3, and you definitely can get a glimpse of it in the trailer being used, and of course, that is that is the hilt of it on Worf's back. He carries it on his back, not unlike Captain America carries his shield. So, uh, this is all very exciting. I was very excited to see this trailer drop today. Had no idea it was dropping. But um, I'm very excited. Uh, to see it. I'm, I'm excited to hear what, what, what you guys uh, think of it. Also, we have, of course, 
the lovely Marina Sirtis coming back. Clearly something's possessed her here, or maybe not. I don't know. She's sensing something. We heard from the trailer. She's sensing evil, darkness, whatever she's sensing. Who knows what it is? I don't know what it is. Um, but it's out there. It's out there. And then, of course, Seven of Nine. Seven of Nine is the first officer aboard the USS Titan. Uh, the Titan A. The Titan Refit. And if you look closely, it... Uh, it is a Neo Constitution class ship, and it even has warp nacelles that have interesting uh, um, features from the when they were going to make the Star Trek Phase Two television series before Star Trek the Motion Picture. It has warp nacelles that have some of those design elements in them, which is very cool. Here is the Titan being pursued. You can see it in the background by the Shrike. By Amanda Plummer's ship, we see uh, they they, um, they they trade blows in this. I don't know what's going on. Uh, maybe you do, but maybe you have ideas. If you do, go down in the comments section and tell me. And then, of course, we have Jean-Luc Picard himself looking a little concerned um, in the trailer. And so I don't I don't know what to tell you, but this trailer. Take your word. Take take Bobby's word on this as I talk about myself in the third person. This trailer tells you nothing. It does what a great trailer does. It teases everything, tells you nothing. I promise. Uh, I, I hope you're intrigued. And I will say this. The trailer was extraordinarily dark. A lot of dark scenes. A lot of what I would call emergency lighting happening in the trailer. The trailer is not, or the, the series is not always that dark. Uh, it does brighten up. And um, it's, it's, it's very interesting. But as far as as far as I can tell you, with the trailer, finally, there's something to back up my statements. I mean, a lot of people I've already seen. Well, you know, Rob, I really prefer my Star Trek where we're going out and exploring things. I don't necessarily want a show about just a villain doing bad stuff. Agreed. That's not. A, I think that the 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 villain of the week trope or the villain of the movie trope in Star Trek has grown tired. I promise you, there's more going on in Star Trek Picard Season 3 than just a villain going after something. And maybe, in grand Star Trek fashion, she's not a villain. Maybe she's an antagonist. Maybe she has something, maybe she has a beef that has uh, underpinnings of something that uh, you might agree with. Maybe not. Who's to say? Um, anyway, I was very excited to see this trailer. I hope you are all very excited to see this trailer. There's a lot of people, I know, there's a lot of questions about what's actually going on. And... Um, you're not going to get any answers from me. I'll tell you that. Other than the fact that, what do you do? Well, I really want to know what everyone thinks of the trailer. Uh, what did I? Because I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what what people are thinking. So, um, um, Kevin Rubio says, "I believe you, Rob." Terry A. All the way from Norway says, "Who is the CPS woman with the Hitler hair?" Uh, Terry A. That's Amanda Plummer. She's Honey Bunny from Pulp Fiction. I. Other than that. Um, I, uh, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to say anything more than that, but she's got an issue. Uh, Justin Welsh, the singing Canadian postie. How are you, sir? Says, watched the Star Trek Picard trailer. Oh my God. Based on your talks of the season, my mouth is watering. Well, listen, I wasn't, I wasn't, um, I wasn't lying to you. I wasn't lying to you. I, I'm not a paid shill for Paramount, although I'm perfectly willing to take their cash. But um, it's pretty exciting, and I hope you guys are going to enjoy it. Uh, Tom Jr. Jackson says, talk about full circle for the Plummer family, Rob. Amanda and her father, Christopher. Yes, for those of you who don't know, Christopher Plummer, of course, played General Chang in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. So it's it's a family it's a family affair. Yes, absolutely, which is pretty pretty extraordinary. Uh, Bert says, can I watch Star Trek Picard season three without any other Star Trek? Well, I, I mean, it would help if you'd seen Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, you don't have to watch Picard seasons one and two, but you really should have a working knowledge of Star Trek The Next Generation uh, for it to. And you have still have time to catch up. It doesn't drop till episode one drops. It'll be weekly. Episode one drops on February 16th. And they're, they're very meaty episodes. They're long episodes, close to an hour uh, each episode. So that's that's very cool. Um, Kevin Rubio says, I'm very excited, Rob, as well you should be. Um, 
we'll see. And there's a lot of people in the in the chat that are, are that are speculating, a lot of speculation going on, which is um, really interesting. <laughs> so I'll tell you, we'll um, we'll see, we'll see what happens, we'll see what you guys think. Jeff Yerky, the Yerkies. Um, you know, I'm glad that the Yerkies are here. Jeff Yerky and, of course, his lovely wife, Mrs. Y, says, Hi, Rob. Mrs. Y and I desperately miss our daily Rob observations. As for Picard, I believe you. Live long and prosper, the Yerk man. Well, Jeff, I've done two Rob observations in less than 24 hours. This is the second one I've done. Uh, I wanted to jump on this and talk about this trailer and give myself, or give myself, give you myself as some feedback. Um, so that is that is pretty interesting. Uh, Stubble McShave says, if the Shrike uh, is in Star Trek Picard, will we see Martin Slaney's? <laughs> That's a Hyperion joke. <laughs> very, very, very good, Stubble. Uh, for those of you, by the way, who don't, have, if you haven't read uh, Dan Simmons, Hyperion Cantos, what are you waiting for? You don't even have to read all four of them. You can read just Hyperion and Fall of Hyperion, and then there's Endymion and Rise of Endymion, but... If you want to read some great literary science fiction, and everybody should, uh, read Dan Simmons' Hyperion Cantos. And he wrote the first Hyperion novel as one long book, but it was almost a thousand pages, and his publisher made him cut it in half. So if you haven't, if you haven't, um, you know, if you haven't read it, please do. Please, please go and read Dan Simmons' Hyperion Cantos. Uh, Matt Reisman says, between you having Terry Metalis on not long ago and now seeing this latest trailer, I am beyond psyched for Picard Season 3. For those of you who don't know, uh, I did interview. I had Doug Drexler for Star Trek Day, September 8th. So you can find it by by searching uh, sep observations September 8th. I did have the great Doug Drexler, and I had Terry Metalis, the showrunner of Picard Season 3, on this channel, and we had a, a great chat. Um, a great chat for Star Trek Day. So that's um, that's pretty exciting. So there you go. Kevin Rubio says, you want to be a paid shill for Paramount Plus? Ask me how. First of all, the, the Star Trek Twitter feed, Star Trek on Paramount Plus, blocked me. They pre-blocked me. When I went to follow them, I was blocked. I was blocked because of my vitriolic, vehement... Um, dislike of modern star trek and yet i've been shilling out here shilling because i love it so much for picard season three and do they reinstate me do they unblock me no they don't it's really interesting i mean i pay for paramount plus specifically to watch star trek and the 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 paramount plus star trek twitter feed has blocked me how does how does a company's twitter feed that of i'm that i'm a customer of block me on twitter Aren't you just supposed to, you're not supposed to have an opinion, are you? Or are you just, I mean, it's very interesting. So, yeah, yeah, Paramount Plus, your, some, one of your social media employees blocked me on Twitter. <laughs> there you go. And obviously, because of that, could not even see that I'm here waxing rhapsodic about the Star Trek Picard trailer that just dropped. Uh, Bert says, is it Christopher Plummer as in Captain Von Trapp? Yes, sir. Yes, Bert. That is absolutely correct. Um, that is Christopher Plummer. Also, Christopher Plummer <laughs> in Star Crash, if you haven't seen Star Crash, as the emperor of the known universe. But yeah, Christopher Plummer has had a long, distinguished career. Christopher Plummer also uh, was at Stratford with who? William Shatner. That is correct. They've known each other for a long time. <sighs> it's very hot. Anyway, I just wanted to come on here and have a quick response to this Star Trek trailer and share my uh, great enthusiasm for the mission, my great enthusiasm for Star Trek Picard Season 3. By the way, Species1571 is asking if I'm going to bring observations back to this time slot. I can't during the week. What I am going to try and do is I'm going to go back to doing daily Rob observations probably at 8 p.m. because I work on the John Campia show during the days. But during the weekends, I'm going to try and bring it back at this time slot. Tomorrow, if you are a member of this channel um, at any level, you can join us at 1 o'clock the afternoon for our member chats every couple of 
weeks, bi-weekly. We have member chats for all members at all levels where we hang out two or three, four hours, and I'm here to answer your questions. What we do is people put their hands up, and they get 10 minutes to speak, and we have conversations, and we just see how long they last. So if you're a channel member, we're going to be doing that tomorrow after Let's Get Physical Media. So... Um, Terrier says, your beard gives me so much, Marlon. Your soldiers are Superman <laughs> or supermen. Well, what can I say? You know, I'm going to shave. I just haven't yet. I will. Um, I'm looking a little old. That is the look of being old if you're a Logan's Run fan. Um, so there you go. It's very exciting. Now, I wanted to read. I'm trying to catch up. There's a few letters that I would like to read. Um uh, channel members, or not even members, anybody can send me a letter. If you want to send me a letter it's for me to read live on the show, you can go to postgeeksingularity.com, and there's a place to send letters to the channel, and I will read them. And I'm going to read a, a, a few letters right now. And I first want to read one from Chris. Actually, I, we read that one for Let's Get Physical Media. Um... Let's see. I will read. Uh, here's one from. Let's. This is from Vincent from France. Actually, you know what? Those are Let's Get Physical Media letters. I apologize. I keep looking at Let's Get. Here we go. Uh, Robert uh, Hoyland Bagrash says this is a really good topic. What is the impact of social media on Hollywood productions? What do you think of this narrative? We owe the so-called Hollywood wokeness to social media, not ideological movie producers. Ever hear of Edward Bernays? Bernays was a propagandist during World War I, who after the war brought his business into peacetime, rebranding propaganda by coining coining the phrase public relations. Bernays was exceptionally skilled at mass manipulation through psychological warfare. His work created a huge industry, and it still influences the way corporations and governments deal with the public in ways that make my skin crawl. Edward Bernays also had a lot to do with the invention of focus group testing, and I imagine companies like Disney have been avid users of these things to give themselves a picture of what people want from or think about a product. But modern social media companies have unquestionably had a huge impact on the PR industry. Twitter, for example, is the place people go to discuss the latest entertainment media, and some products even seem to live and die by the way social media users react. We know that Twitter sells our data, and they probably have a pretty good picture of what our interests are. The data has to be incredibly attractive to companies like Disney. And what does this data say? The loudest and most active users dominate Twitter. This is why representation without meaningful storytelling is so commonplace, because that is what social media user engagement says is popular. I think Batgirl was canceled for the same reason. Warner Brothers has probably seen data suggesting that Batgirl, as it had been made, would have been received too poorly by most active DC discussing accounts to warrant spending more on it. This may not explain every odd decision that these companies have taken, but I think this makes a lot more sense than the idea that these studio heads have decided to let go of profit in an attempt to turn everybody into feminists through storytelling in movies. I think the reason that some people feel it has taken a leftist turn is that the people running our social medias are young, self-described progressives. This, no doubt, influences things like moderation and what their algorithms are promoting. I don't think there is a grand plan to ruin something like, say, Star Wars. I think Disney believed that the formula they were creating would cater to the largest and most engaged audience. And they got that view because their window to the world is needlessly small. And this happened because it's probably cost-effective to buy a data pack from Twitter consisting of information about massive groups of people compared to doing focus group testing with a very limited number of people. I could go on about this forever, but I wanted to make this short and sweet. I would like to recommend the filmography of Adam Curtis. I'm a huge Adam Curtis fan, actually. To anyone who's interested in this, especially Century of the Self and Can G Get Out of My Head, or Can G Get Get You Out of My Head, are particularly relevant to what I've written about there or here. Yes, first of all, I want to say Adam Curtis is great. Uh, Robin Hoyland, I want to thank you, or Bagrash, I want to thank you for writing in. That's a... 
Look, that's a very good question. I mean, I, I, I look at it this way. I think in a way we're all social justice warriors in the sense that we all want social justice for people. We want justice for human beings. We want justice for our friends, our relatives, and our countrymen. We want justice for the rest of the planet Earth. Uh, human life is so fleeting that every person deserves, I mean, I've talked about it on the show before. I believe that like every human being, the existence of every human being, if you go back and you've read your Alan Moore Watchmen, the whole reason Dr. Manhattan comes back to Earth and agrees to help save mankind from Armageddon is because he realizes that every human life is the product of a thermodynamic miracle. The fact that we even exist at all with all the different currents and eddies that could have taken any moment in time into a different direction that might have led to our non-existence is astonishing. And with that attitude, every human being, in fact, every, every life on Earth, really, is precious. And if, especially in this sector of space, if there's not a lot of us here, I mean, think about it in the cosmic infinitude of, of, the, of the universe, how rare life might be, and yet we're so quick to want to get rid of everybody's. Um, and, and when I say life, I mean the people that are here right now. And the people the, the, that uh, will be here later and will be here in the future. I don't give a fuck about history because history is gone. It's passed us by. And I think that we have to learn from history, but don't let history be an anchor that stops us from moving forward. And the idea of progressing, I think, is, is, a, is a good idea. I think one of the real problems in terms of all this progressive thought is, remember, Hollywood... They're not selling politics or an agenda. They're not. They're selling entertainment that they want you to buy. And what they want what you to do is they want people to buy their product and they use social media as a gauge by what kind of products they think people will buy. And what's really interesting, I've been fascinated by the recent case of Bros. Uh, the movie Bros that Nicholas Stoller directed and Billy Eichner uh, uh, wrote. And there's a lot of talk about how it was the first gay rom-com and how it, it failed miserably at the box office. Let me say right now that Bros is a very well-written film. It's also very funny. It's a good movie. But here's the thing. I don't know why, I mean, here, here's here's where I think that, that uh, the world that we live in and things like Twitter and and uh, believing in all of the very loudest people on social media, looking at, at TikTok videos and all that, why none of that translates to the entertainment that we are we are buying, and we're seeing it. We're it, it, the the quality of entertainment has been suffering because they normally the normal indicators of what they would normally look at to tell them whether or not somebody was going to go see a movie have been skewed by the misperception that the loudest voices on social media actually matter. I don't think they really do. And I think a movie like Bros um, uh, shows that. Now, let me preface what I'm about to say by saying Bros is a good movie. Bros is a funny movie. It was directed by somebody who really understands comedy, and the performers in it are uniformly great. The acting is great. The performances are terrific. It is a well-crafted film. The problem is, the problem that I, as I see it, it was billed as a gay rom-com, a gay romantic comedy. That's what they've been saying. Well, here's the thing. The romantic comedy genre, now I'm going to generalize here, is a traditionally female-oriented genre. I like a good rom-com, but I'll tell you something. I was not about to rush out into the theater and go see Ryan Gosling in The Notebook. The demographic that goes to see romantic comedies is predominantly women. Women. Now, now, here's the thing. That's neither good nor bad. It's just a fact. So here's the thing. If you want to make like, there are rom-coms that I really love. I loved Annie Hall. I, I, I have a soft spot for the movie The Holiday. I love Sleepless in Seattle. I love When Harry Met Sally. I really like great rom-coms. I love Matthew McConaughey rom-coms. Uh, rom-coms are usually enjoyable films. I don't go out to the theater to see them, but I really enjoy them as a movie watcher. Clearly, uh, there's a lot of rom-coms that have terrific screenplays. I would consider a movie like Tootsie a romantic comedy because there's a big romantic component in the film. It's a straight-up comedy, and it, it, it's even about a man who hides cross-dressing to get his career on track. Uh, and that movie came out 40 years ago this year. Tootsie is 40, 40 
years old. I love great romantic comedies. But the thing about Bros and the reason that it didn't work in terms of being at the box office is that a gay romantic comedy, immediately you get rid of your female audience. I mean, rightly or wrongly, you just do. And the problem then is, then if you're attracting the gay audience, if you look at what is the, what is the demographic of the gay population in the United States, most of them are urban dwellers. So you've only got certain markets that you can open the movie in that has a gay audience. But like people pointed out on Twitter, Billy Eichner is blaming heterosexuals for not going to see bros. I would say the blame is squarely on everybody because one, a gay romantic comedy does not appeal to the demographic that romantic comedies usually appeal to. That doesn't mean they're not going to enjoy it or not going to go, but they're certainly not going to roll out for bros the way they rolled out for Ryan Gosling in The Notebook. And anybody that thinks any different, it has nothing to do with... Uh, whether people are homophobic or not, it has to do with rom-coms for women are wish fulfillment fantasies the same way that watching superhero movies are wish fulfillment fantasies for men. Now the demographic has changed. We have, everybody loves a great superhero movie now, but it used to be back in the day when Tim Burton's Batman came out, who did that appeal to? You know, we're the nerds, man. It appealed to us. So the problem with something like Bros as I said, it's a good, funny movie that's really well performed. It has a great script and it's well directed. It's a good movie. I dare say it's probably could be considered a great movie. But the problem is, and even the gay audience. Now, I have a lot of gay friends, but I'll tell you something. I don't hear my gay friends talking about how they're going to roll out and see a movie on a Friday or Saturday night. They tell me they're doing other things on Friday and Saturday night. So your target audience for bros, both the gay audience and the, the gay male audience and the, the, the heterosexual audience, male or female, that's interested in rom-coms, you've eliminated both of those audiences are not going to see your movie opening weekend. What they should have done with a movie like bros is built up its reputation over a long and, and fruitful festival run. But see, the problem is when that movie was greenlit, whoever greenlit that film, was, was listening to social media, was listening to the loud voices on Twitter thinking this is going to be a good idea. And it's not about get woke, go broke. It's just that we the, the reality of what's going on in our nation, the reality of demographics, the reality of people, the reality of your marketplace, it doesn't matter who believes what. What matters is who's going to pay for your product. Who's going to pay for it? And at the end of the day, great stories are universal. The more universal a story is, and I don't mean in the universe, I mean great stories like, for instance, The Shawshank Redemption. All right? A lot of people didn't go when that movie first came out because one, no one knew what it was about. What does that mean, Shawshank Redemption? And it's a movie set in a prison. But if you sit down and watch that movie, or, or you watch, think, pick your favorite movie. Casablanca is one of the great romantic comedies, but it's also a tense World War II thriller. It's a film that, assuming you're, you, you won't go, I'm not going to watch a black and white movie from the 40s, Rob. I'm just not going to do it. Assuming you're not one of those people, if you sit down and watch yourself some Casablanca, it is universally a great movie. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what your sexuality is, what your religious beliefs are. That film speaks to, like all great stories, it speaks to universal truths that all of us can understand. Now, what we've got going on now, in our world, we have voices that have been marginalized and not heard, whether it's people of color, whether it's LGBTQ, there's people that have not had the opportunity to speak. And I, as a connoisseur of stories, I like the more specific a story, especially when a, a, a movie like Bros comes out and deals with a very specific uh, culture in a very specific way. Bros is very much about ur uh, the urban gay experience. <laughs> It's it probably doesn't it probably doesn't uh, deal with the 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 farming gay experience or the rural gay experience. It's a very specific, and I love that specificity. You know, give me specifics, and I think we need more voices in film. We need more people of color, more women, more people from around the world, because the more stories that are being told, the better off we are as a people. The better off we are as, as, as human beings, our souls are more enriched because we understand the world more. The question is, can a financier expect to get a return on their investment throughout through the movie that you make? And the answer to that must be yes. 
and studios are not chasing. Look, they would love it. They want to make movies on all their on all of their. They they want to make money on all their movies. But the fact is, if you're if you're making a film about a specific group of people, the more specific it is, it might not translate to box office dollars. So, you know, all the studios are are going for these things, and because there have been loud voices on social media that have made it seem, especially if you do the analytics, there are voices screaming out in pain and and anguish and frustration. Those voices are being heard more so than ever before. But just because they're loud and 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 we hear a lot of them on social media it does not mean that those people are rolling out on Friday night or Thursday night previews to go see bros. They didn't do that. So it's not just that people look anybody can pick up you get an iPhone 14, the camera the cameras in those cameras are very sophisticated. You get four of those, you can make yourself a slick Hollywood production. Now it's really hard to make a movie that's any good. But anybody can make a film. I hate when people are like, well, the gatekeepers in Hollywood. You can make a movie and you can you can it, you can put it up yourself and self-distribute it worldwide. Now, does that mean you're gonna get rich? No. It means that you, if you decide to make a film and distribute it yourself, you have to do what studios have to do, which is put a hell of a lot of money into marketing, but you can do it. No one in this day and age is preventing anyone from making a feature film and putting it out there. I mean, basically, look at how much creativity is on TikTok. And the real question is, what do you want out of it? Do you want to get rich making a movie? Look, do you think Spike Lee, when he made She's Gotta Have It, which is one of the great breakthrough, you talk about people of color and their breakthrough voices. Spike Lee, She's Gotta Have It, was it, I mean, how would that appeal to me, a uh, uh, high, uh, high school, college age, newly minted college age kid, Jewish kid from Seattle? What would I want to see a movie like She's Gotta Have It for? Well, it's a great movie. <laughs> it was very specific and it told me more about a culture I didn't know much about. Great film. And that's what Spike Lee wanted to do is make a great movie. I don't know if Spike Lee thought he was going to get rich when he made She's Gotta Have It, but he certainly burned up the festival circuit. So the real question is, what can be sold to the masses? Movies are too expensive. They're, 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 now, are people trying to uh, cast more diverse people in movies? Absolutely. 100%. And why not? You're trying to make more money. The problem is, if it feels like you're pandering to your audience, if it's not genuine, you can tell. Look, the truth of great storytelling is self-evident. And if the truth of the stories that you're trying to tell has been skewed for whatever reason, I always like to use this as an example. I'm going to go back to Shawshank Redemption. I use this all the time. No one... I love Shawshank Redemption. It, it was one of the novellas that appeared in Stephen King's 1982 collection, Different Seasons, along with The Body that became Stand By Me, App Pupil, which Brian Singer made the movie of, with Brad Renfro and, and uh, Ian McKellen, and then a movie that's never uh, been made yet called The Breathing Method. I used to read, read the stories called Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption. The character that Morgan Freeman plays, Red, was a redhead Irishman in the book. He was not black in the story. No one who has seen Shawshank Redemption a dozen times or whatever has ever thought to themselves, you know what, they raced swapped the character from the original, the original text. No one. I guarantee you. Nobody ever has ever mentioned that diverse, I mean, get woke, go broke, the diverse casting, the Morgan Freeman's playing a white guy. Nobody ever thought that ever. You know why? Because the movie's fucking great. And when you're watching, you don't think that. They even keep the line in the movie. Why do they call you red? Maybe it's because I'm Irish. I mean, nobody cares. Where, where people start to care about all this stuff is when it's obvious that people are trying to pander to those loud voices. That's the problem. And their stories are compromised. That, that's when things go awry. And it's obvious, and I think that you realize when that's happening, that means the entire story that's being told is also compromised because the reality is they're not people are not telling the stories for the right reasons, and they're trying to do something that is not true to the tale. When you tell a great story, we all know what great stories are. There's a reason why the AFI Top 100 movies are considered the AFI Top 100 movies. I think most people can agree. They look at a great story, and they can see whether that story is truthful. I'm always bitching about authorship. What do I love about movies? Give me, give me a great story. I don't care if it's a comic. I don't care if it's a record album. 
you know, I, I mean, I would listen to Lana Del Rey. If you're, I, I know something about Lana Del Rey listening to her records. I don't feel that that she has 10 different songwriters writing her material. Maybe she does. I don't know. But then, I, of course, she picked those songs so you could... Maybe that's a bad example, but I like Lana Del Rey. When I when I listen to a Lana Del Rey record, I feel like okay, I'm getting a little insight into who Lana Del Rey is. All I want is authorship, true authorship. I want to see, I want to see a movie that, and that's why I'm excited to see Wakanda Forever. I think that we're going to get something. Ryan Coogler is a writer director. He's an auteur, and whatever we get from him is going to be heartfelt and honest, at least as far as he's concerned. He's trying to do something that other people haven't done before. And that's why I'm interested to see how Namor and the Talacan Empire or whatever, it's the Confederacy, the hegemony, whatever it is, how it works. How does it work? I don't know. As long as it's good. So anyway, it was an interesting question that you posed, an interesting letter. But as always, what, do, what does Hollywood want to do? They want to make a product that sells to the most people. So they make the most money. The question is, and uh, I think a movie like Bros, it's not because it wasn't a good movie. That, the funny thing about Bros is it did have authorship. It did feel honest and genuine and heartfelt, and it was funny. Unfortunately, they believed that there was an audience that for that film, whether it was the straight audience or the gay audience, that wasn't there, at least not theatrically in wide release. They should have picked a different tact, and maybe they, they would have come up with a different, um, a different result. Anyway, that's just a, th a theory it's a theory. I mean, if I'm happy to have it disproven or you can tell me to fuck fucking fuck myself and then I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Happy to, uh, you know, all things may be true. <laughs> I'm just, these are just your observations. After, uh, they're not supposed to be necessarily the perfect, um, the perfect observations. So here's a, uh, here's a letter from Roger writes in. Star Trek lives. Hi, Rob. I've been meaning to write to you for a while. I wanted to express my appreciation for your defense uh -oh, of real Star Trek. As a young biracial kid growing up in America in the 1980s, I had several unique challenges to deal with. And the one constant overriding support for me was OG Star Trek. Captain Kirk was the stand in for my absent father. And Spock was the man I strive to be in my daily life. An alien like me, yet ever striving to do the right thing. Pretend woke virtue signaling means nothing to me. I was dealing with life and death situations even as a child. And Star Trek helped keep me alive. Someday, we will achieve the grand goals set before us in an old science fiction series from the 20th century. Hopefully without having to go through another world war. <laughs> I hope so. But until then, I will listen to Rob's observations. Be entertained and dream. Thank you, Rob, from the bottom of my heart. Roger. Roger, uh, great letter. And I would say, yeah, because, you know, I think, look, I understand what it's like for people to be represented on screen. And they haven't had that kind of representation. You know, I just saw there's a trailer. Elvis Mitchell who has covered entertainment and, and Hollywood for a very long time, I didn't realize this, has made a documentary that is produced by Steven Soderbergh and um, David Fincher. And I saw a trailer for it yesterday. Let me get the name of it. Uh, uh, documentary. And the documentary is called, Is That Black Enough For You? It looks fantastic. Uh, it deals with the rise of black filmmakers in the 70s and the 80s. And boy, and it's also a personal journey for him. And he interviews a lot of great black stars, a lot of great black filmmakers. It looks incredible. And it's called, um, Is That Black Enough For You? The trailer, by the way, the trailer dropped yesterday. It's on YouTube. It's going to be on Netflix. And again, it's from Elvis Mitchell. I've always loved Elvis Mitchell. I've always loved listening to his insights. Um, so run don't walk go watch that trailer and tune in for that documentary because uh, again i mean as i said i want to hear more diverse voices because they'll tell stories that we haven't heard before and that's what i'm looking for great stories well told and here's another thing i don't need to see myself reflected on screen i've seen myself reflected on screen my whole life 
I would rather watch movies that aren't about me or anyone close to me because it gives me insight into worlds and and situations and 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 things of lives that I know nothing about. And I think that storytelling, especially cinema, whether it's now these long form streaming shows or movies, I mean, look, I don't want to see the movie format go away. I think the two hour format, the the three act structure of a movie is one of the greatest ways to convey information ever devised by man. It's the great cinema is the greatest art form. It takes all the other art forms and then puts the added spin of technology into it. And there's never been a more powerful form of storytelling than cinema, than movies. And why is the movie going theater going experience? Why is it important? It's important because it's the one place on planet earth where you can get people from all walks of life, all shapes, sizes, colors, creeds, beliefs, whatever, put them in a room, They'll be sitting right next to somebody they might not even know they hate in their daily lives. But you're all sitting together, and every one of those people is concentrating on that screen. When the light illuminates that screen, nothing else matters. Suddenly, all the people around you, you might not like any of them. But for the time that you're going to watch something on a screen, you'll get in a room with people that you might not get in a room with any other time of day. And you're not looking around going, well, maybe some people are. But for the most part, you're more excited and and it's a way to have a collective experience. All walks of life, movies are the great equalizer. You know? You get in a room with people, there's power in that. And when you are given a great story, come on. Isn't it the greatest thing ever? We can't let that go away. If nothing else, the collective experience of, experience story, of experiencing stories together in a room. Even though you might never ever talk to those people, when you hear a room of people laughing at the same thing that you're laughing at. It shows that we're all part of this. We're all in this together, man. That's why the theater-going experience is important. So make, please make sure, theater owners, that your projector bulbs are bright enough. Don't try and save money by turning them down. Give us, give, it, give us the lumens we need. I need that luminance. I want that brightness. You know, if people would calibrate their goddamn TVs, you could see House of the Dragon like I did. Those day-for-night scenes with sparkling stars in the sky. Just take some time to perfectly calibrate your TVs. You won't have a problem. Same with theater owners. I don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, uh, there you go. So, Roger, thank you for writing in. That's a great letter, you know, and, and that's why I hear Star Trek, you know, it gave people hope, which um, is a great thing. I love that. And what a, what a, what a great, um, what a great, um, what a great letter. So, yeah, that was, that was very nice. Let's see what are what are what are people uh, what are people saying? Um, let's say uh, Terrier says, "Don't shave, no bad boy." <laughs> well, you know it is getting a little scraggly. Uh, Two hundred watt studio says anything including ships, characters, etc. in Picard are not canon. Well, uh, I will tell you something about Star Trek Picard season three that Terry Metalis did. How can I put this? When it comes to starships, he did things I never thought I would see in modern Star Trek. One thing in particular that I can't, it's something specific. I don't want to even say it because I don't want somebody to say, you got to change that. I don't know if anyone's paying attention, but it's it's a glorious thing to behold. Uh, all I can say is Fleet Museum. <laughs> Just, that's all I'm saying. Fleet Museum. Uh, you'll know it when you see it. V, V says French Kiss. Love that movie. Yeah. I mean, come on, we love, we love, uh, we love that. Um, 200 Watt Studio says, Worf aged too fast for a long-lived Klingon. He looks like Kor did when he was 100 years old. He must have got the same disease that aged Guinan. Nope. Worf looks exactly the same, only his hair has changed. His face looks exactly the same. It looks like he hasn't aged a day other than his hair. That's the only thing that, uh, and who's to say his hair didn't go, look at my hair. I mean, I, I I basically went white in 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 a year. I, I turned white. Who's to say his hair hair? I like it. I like the um, I like the Pi May look for him, and um, I think it's a good look. I enjoy it. I think it's awesome. <laughs> but the rest of his face, hey man, right back to the old Klingon makeup. He looks exactly the same. Michael Dorn looks fucking great. I'm all I can say is that Michael Dorn in Star Trek Picard season three, it might be the best Worf has ever been. You get a little taste in the trailer. All I'm saying is that Worf is a fucking 
baller badass. And that's if I've seen it in Picard season three. Um, Henry back to play says variety hashtag Star Trek Discovery. Alex Kurtzman shares that a musical episode is possible. Nothing would make me happier. Hey, sure, whatever, <laughs> whatever. Uh, um, Echo Base, my friends at Echo Base, how you guys doing? Uh, Nick and Coach, I'm at least curious on Picard uh, season three at this point, but after seasons one, I refuse to watch season two. Spot on on the forced uh, diversion comments or division comments, by the way. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Um, uh, so let me just tell you, if you hated Star Trek Picard seasons one and two, as I did, while there are certain things they couldn't get away from, you don't have to have watched Star Trek Picard season one and two to enjoy Star Trek Picard season three is 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 picking up 30 years after nemesis just think of it that way and um it, that's what it is and and you can enjoy it it's it, it is like the eighth season of next generation uh it just takes place that many years later so you don't even have to um watch it, it's i'm telling you you'll love it uh Bradley Michael says, "Do you agree that Star Trek 09 has a great score?" I do like the scores. I don't I don't like the entirety of Star Trek 09. I like a lot of it. I like the theme Enterprising Young Men is a great track. Um it, you know what? It 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 doesn't have well, obviously Jerry Goldsmith's Star Trek the Motion Picture score is one of the great musical scores ever written. James Horner's scores for Star Trek 2 and 3 are great scores even though his motifs um you know, he he borrowed some of them from things he'd made before, as James Horner's want to do. But they're great scores. Uh, I really love Jerry Goldsmith's score for Star Trek V, and Cliff Eidelman's score for Star Trek VI is quite good. I even I was never a big Dennis McCarthy fan during the TNG era, but there's a lot of music in his Generation score that I really like. But yeah, Giacchino's score for Star Trek 09 is a good score. It's good. Um. Uh. Um. Echo Base Network says Force Diversity, yes. Uh, Chris Nimitz says, Rob, is Ro Laren also coming back? Your thoughts? Well, uh, you know, I, I love Michelle Forbes. I, I do. And I love the character of Ro Laren. And obviously everybody knows that, um, you know, Kira Norris was, they wanted her to come back for Deep Space Nine. I, I really like this. I especially like the relationship that Ro Laren uh, had with Captain Picard. I thought it was good. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I would like to see... Uh, Michelle Forbes come back and do Star Trek, but she used to live across the street from me, and um, you know, I, I, uh, that would be cool. But I just, I just, I, I, I never got from her that she loved Star Trek, you know. Um, so does Ro Laren come back from Star Trek? Well, hope springs eternal, you know. What can I say? Um, I'd like to see Ro Laren come back to Star Trek at some point. Um, Bradley Michael says, Star Trek ad on the Terry interview, Paige Schill confirmed. Is that true? Well, you know, the ads aren't always the same when you watch, depending on who you are. Uh, I wish I was a Paige Schill for Star Trek. And by the way, I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to do it. I used to be, I was actually a paid Star Trek consultant for Viacom licensing in the mid nineties. So I've actually been paid. I've been paid on three different professional Star Trek projects. I was a professional Star Trek consultant for Viacom Licensing. I worked for the Star Trek Experience for almost two years, cutting all the videos that went into the $80 million theme park that was at the Las Vegas Hilton. And I worked on the Star Trek The Next Generation and Star Trek Enterprise Blu-rays, creating all the special features with Roger Lay Jr. And we did we did uh, all the seasons, and then we did the single episode discs. And when, when they put the two episodes, like, Best of Both Worlds disc. We did more documentaries for those. So for TNG, we did seven seasons and then five single discs, and then we did four seasons of Enterprise. So I worked for CBS. So I was paid to work for them. I am not paid. Look, the amount of sh why do you think Paramount Plus Star Trek's Twitter feed blocked me? I have been very, but I, I'm happy. Star Trek is my favorite. It's my favorite franchise. I would I would shill for Star Trek. They'd have to pay me. By the way, they'd have to also bring Eagle Moss back. Because, to be honest, there are things in Star Trek Picard Season 3 I really wanted to get, like, to buy, you know. Um, and especially the Eagle Moss, the uh, XL line. I love the XL line, and it's gone. I mean, these were these were great because, you know, if you didn't... I mean, these the XL line was really, really good. 
that Eagle Moss did, and I was buying the Enterprise D, the thousand or it was gonna be what twenty five hundred dollars when you got all the things, the the pieces, and they went out. I, I already spent like a thousand dollars, been doing it for like a year and a half, and now I'm not gonna get the rest of the parts to build my Enterprise D. Thank you. So they don't even. I, I would shill for Paramount if they just gave me the rest of the pieces for the Enterprise D. <laughs> just do that, please, please. Um. Uh. But Sponge, but Sponge says on Picard season three, uh, I was thinking, wouldn't Worf uh, view being a spy to be dishonorable? He was disdainful of Garrick on DS9 for this very reason. It doesn't lessen my anticipation for Picard season three, but it does nag my thoughts a bit. Who says Worf is a spy? Um, you know, uh, I there I think spying is different than intelligence gathering. If that's in fact what Worf is doing, um, and I, I don't, I think that what Worf views as being dishonorable is being dishonest, and Garrick was inherently being dishonest. So, um, you know, I think that's what Worf doesn't like. The Jughead, our friend from the UK, uh, uh, one of two. Hi, Rob. I loved your astute observation whilst commenting on the Kukul Khan reference during the Wakanda Forever trailer. I also had the same thought. For those of you who don't who don't uh, know what he's talking about, what the Jughead is talking about, when I first saw the new trailer for Wakanda Forever, the first time I ever heard Kukul Khan and understood, I'll tell you something, here's one of the things Star Trek did for me, and the reason why the fact that Atlantis is now the Talokan Empire, because when I was a kid, I read a lot of books on ancient astronauts and stuff like, you know, the Bermuda Triangle and the Outer Space Connection, which was a book and a movie from Sun Classic Pictures. And I read all kinds of books, uh, Chariots of the Gods, and they talked about the disappearance of the Mayan culture and the lines at Nazca. And, you know, the, the when you saw them from the sky, they look like airport landing strips and all that. And then in the, the second to last, the penultimate uh, episode 21 of the Star Trek animated series that actually aired... Did it, I, I want to say it aired in on on October tenth, nineteen seventy four. So it aired forty eight years ago. There was an animated episode called "How Sharper Than a Serpent's Tooth," and and Kukul Khan comes back. <laughs> Kukul Khan, man, is in an animated Star Trek episode. And by the way, it's a great animated Star Trek episode. And that was when I first heard that in the Wakanda Forever trailer. I'm like, all right. You know, Kevin Feige's a Star Trek fan. I'm sure Ryan Coogler's a Star Trek fan, too. Maybe the Star Trek animated series. Hey, the first Star Trek day they had, they they don't talk about it because, oh, we've got Lower Decks and Prodigy now. They don't even acknowledge that the Star Trek animated series existed. It won a daytime, a ch child, an Emmy Award, Daytime Emmy Award. It ran 22 episodes. Most of the original writing staff of Star Trek, the original series, wrote for that show. Walter Koenig wrote an episode, not a great episode, called The Infinite Vulcan, but he wrote one. So... There you go. Um, Norwegian Kryptonian says, will we see more characters from Voyager in Star Trek Picard season three? I don't know. Do we? And even if I knew, would I, could I tell you that? I couldn't tell you that, could I? No. Nor would I. I wouldn't want to ruin anything for you. Uh, the Jughead says, we obviously both have a criminal, uh, a love of the criminally underappreciated Star Trek, the animated series. Love and respect from the UK, brother. Hey, look, we were even talking about when we were working on Star Trek, the uh, Star Trek, um, the next generation, that when CBS Digital was doing the restoration work, uh, restoring all the effects and, and retiming all the, the negative for that restoration, there was talk about reanimating. Because the, what really makes, I mean, obviously the voice acting is not the strongest in the animated series because not everybody was in the room together and it was hard. The actors, just because you're a great actor on screen doesn't mean you're a great voice actor. But if you could go back and take the original voice tracks, you could reanimate the Star Trek, the animated series. And there was a test that was actually done by CBS Digital uh, to do this. And they could take the audio tracks and reanimate the, that. And, and I think they should. Do something entirely new. New animation, new 3D animation. I mean, it could be fantastic. Um, um, so yeah, SV Guru 2000 says, saw the Odyssey class from Star Trek Online in the trailer. Now I'm stoked. Let me just say, 
Showrunner Terry Metalis, nobody who's working over there on Star Trek would have put a ship from Star Trek Online, much less the Enterprise F, which is a dope class, sh- a dope ass ship. I love that ship. Would put that in in the, and much less feature it in the trailer. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> <clears throat> so. I'm, I'm, by the way, this is just water. It's sober October. <clears throat> Legion. 0121 says, I'm a gay male, but I'm rural, <coughs> not urban. I hunt. I'm libertarian. I drive a pickup truck. Hollywood isn't interested in me. That's okay. I just want a good story. In my opinion, urban LGBT is overrepresented on TV. <coughs> I am not a gay male. I'm Call me gay adjacent, gay friendly. But I, I think I totally agree with you. I mean, I know I totally agree with you. That's what I was saying earlier. And, and that's the whole thing, is all of these groups that are talking about representation, all of these individuals, they're talking about representation in the way that they individually want representation to happen. And I'm of the opinion that we were on a, <clears throat> we were on a good path. It might not have been happening as fast as people wanted it to happen, but gay marriage was the law of the land. We were evolving because, you know, ultimately human beings should be able to live and let live as long as what they're doing doesn't harm other people we should encourage people to be their unique selves and i think our civilization was doing that some places were doing it faster than others all of that's out the window that natural evolutionary process has been completely disrupted by by i think a lot of performance activists that are doing it to feel better about themselves there's a very huge uh there's a there's a gigantic narcissistic streak in a lot of the performance activism activists that we see. And it's really unfortunate because they're not thinking about the big picture. You know, you can't, you can't make social gr- massive social change without thinking about all sides of how does that massive social change affect the fabric of civilization. And I think that lack of understanding or consideration for the rest of the world, everybody just wants to barrel into a room and scream and yell, the way certain activists treat other human beings is really appalling. Now, I understand you have to be loud and you have to make your feelings known, but you can't do it in such a way that you are harming others when you're bringing your message forth. You've got to figure out a way to do both. And I think that there's a lot of people who have um, done a lot of damage to the very causes that they want to um, see recognized through the way they're doing things. And sometimes, of course, you have to have things like Stonewall needed to happen. Those kinds of things happen. But the way that the way that certain people are treating activists are treating other people that might might get to where they want to be, but they're they're so put off by the methods by which people are using to do it, especially online. I mean, the bullying that goes on in all on all on all directions. But it's interesting that you say that you know you want a good story and that urban LGBT is over represented on tv you know what i would love to see a story about a gay relationship in a rural area what would that be like because clearly it'd be different than what we've seen before i think see again that's a story i'd want to see and we did we did see that i mean we did kind of see that in broke back mountain which i thought was a fucking great movie um that i think that's a perfect example of of if you're open-minded enough that you can watch that i mean that movie my god talk about a romantic tragedy uh, what a great film. Um, uh, Kevin Morales says, I just saw the Star Trek Picard trailer. Is it bad that I want to see this in a theater? It looks awesome. One word, Moriarty. Well, it's interesting that you say that because I had heard the idea floated that the last two episodes could very well be released as a film. I mean, as a like a two-hour movie. I'll go on record right now and say that's a great fucking idea. I don't know how it would interact. Like, I don't understand. Uh, Look, I believe that any streaming service, if you put something in a theater and it's successful, all it does is up the value of the product that's eventually going to be on streaming. Obviously, Star Trek Picard, they want to have subscribers. They want to keep their subscription base at Paramount+. Plus. Um. I mean, why did why did all the movies just leave Paramount Plus? Why did all the Star Trek films go away? But I I do think that there is something to be said for 
if I were if I were running Paramount right now, knowing what I know, I would release episodes one through eight, and then for a month, I would put the last two episodes of Star Trek Picard season three in a movie theater, in IMAX, whatever. It's already done. It's already you've got produced material, and and you've got your trailer now. I would release. And they won't do it because because nobody nobody can think outside the box that way. I guarantee you, if you are running Star Trek Picard season uh, uh, season three, which starts on February sixteenth, and you release episodes one through eight, and then for a month, make it a forty five day window. People will wait. I know. Look, there's gonna be everybody's gonna bit. I know people are gonna people would freak out. But you know what? It'd be really fucking cool. Because uh, the last two episodes of Star Trek Picard are a fucking movie. I'm just saying, they're a movie. They look like a movie. They're mixed like a movie. They have a soundtrack that sounds like a movie. If I'd seen it. I'm not saying I saw it. But if I did, I can tell you that they should release... Start, uh, you know, the, the Fathom events, they they put, uh, when, when we did the remastering 10 years ago of Star Trek The Next Generation, they put episodes, they put episodes in the theaters um, to promote the, the, the Blu-rays. And they looked fantastic. And those, those screenings were packed. And what's really interesting um, is that one of the, the, one of the Star Trek The Next Generation directors complained to the DGA that they weren't getting residuals from the, th- I mean, this was, this was a one time only, this was a one time only, um, thing happening. And, and one of the very guys that was working with us on doing the special features for the Blu-rays complained to the DGA that Paramount was doing one night only charity screenings was bitching about residuals. I'm like, bro, you directed this episode of TV 25 fucking years ago. You haven't got enough residuals from the DGA for doing this already. You've been helping us. We got one of your episodes in the theater. Actually, two of your episodes in the theater. And you got you bitched and moaned and complained. So I'm sure somebody, there's some legitimate legal reason where, why somebody would say, no, you can't do that. But you know what? It'd be fucking cool if they did. It would be so cool if they did. I'm, I think everybody should start a campaign online. Release Picard episodes 9 and 10 in the theater. That would be dope as fuck. It would be awesome. They should do it. But they won't. But they should. Uh, so, Kevin. Kevin, you and I, buddy. We uh, we park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. I would do it. I would do it because I'm willing to bet you. Star Trek Picard is that good. It's that good. I'm telling you. It moves at a breakneck pace. Is there going to be people that go, well, Rob, but what about this? This is the, the, no, no, no. Trust me. It's, it's, it's like, it's like a Star Trek movie that lasts for uh, 10 hours. It is. You can kind of see it. Although I have to say this, to be honest, the, the, I thought the trailer was timed dark, but whatever. It looks fantastic. The music. I would love to play you a trap. I guess I can't do that. I totally get demonetized. Not that I, anyway. The Jughead goes on to say, my favorite Star Trek The Animated Series episodes are five, Bem, great episode, four, The Jihad. I think it's just, is it The Jihad or just Jihad? That's a great episode too. Three, House Sharper Than a Serpent's Tooth, two, The Infinite Vulcan, and one, Yesteryear. Those are all great episodes, although I might I might swap out Infinite Vulcan. It's a little goofy, you know. Um, I like the Ambergris element. Uh, that's pretty good. I love Beyond the Furthest Star. I think that was the first one I saw. I think that was the first one aired, maybe. Um, that was good stuff. Ari G is a new member. Ari, as a new member, remember tomorrow, 1 o'clock Pacific time, we're having a member chat. If you're a member of this channel, we are going to have a member chat. So become you can become a member for a dollar a month or more if you want. Um, but tomorrow, 1 o'clock, we have a member chat. They usually last. It'll be after Dieter and I do Let's Get Physical Media. They usually last three to four hours, depending on how many people want to talk. Um, Terrier sends in sends in a, a super sticker of a burger. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Appreciate that. Uh, Sir Clive Calculator sends in a super chat and says, "Here's some DS9 characters named after theaters in London's West End: the Garrick, the Curzon Cinema, and the Dominion. Were those actually were those? Oh, they they were named after. I, I believe that. I like that." 
that's really interesting. Um, that is really interesting. I didn't, I did not know that. Um, <clears throat> the Richard, or you know, just Richard, not the Richard, Richard sends in a tip and says, Star Trek Lower Decks quote of the day. Tendi receives news about becoming a science officer. Tendi, like Jadzia Dax? Doctor. Who the fuck is that? I don't know who that is. No, like Spock. <laughs> yeah, see, that's why I don't like, that's why I don't like uh, Star Trek Lower Decks. It's, I mean, I know it's a goof. I get it. We all sci-fi, but it's, that's a good quote. It's a good quote. Our friend Alexander Wilson says, don't forget R&B that sporting events are a venue that accepts people from all kinds because your goal being that there is to root for your team or organize or against the other team. It's not about who you are or what you are. Alexander, great example. That's the whole thing, man. Look, the, the fact that we have, we can't all get together and uh, enjoy each other, I don't, I don't, um, I don't understand. Uh, Alexander Wilson says, do you no longer use stream elements? No, I use stream elements. Absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, you just said you just sent me a, a tip on stream elements. No, you can go to stream elements and uh, I'm looking at stream. If you want to send a tip in or you uh, want to send a, a super chat in, you can either way. I'm looking at both. Looking at both. Uh, I think I'm going to read another letter because the letters, you guys, I love it when you guys are, you're on fire with the letters. Let me see what I got. Um because I, I, I love reading your letters. Remember, if you're new to this channel, you can go to postgeeksingularity.com and you can send me a letter. It's free of charge. And I try and read everything. I'm, I'm a little bit behind, but I try and um, read everything. Here's something. Uh, this comes from Glenn Mark. Glenn Mark says, our friend Glenn Mark says, wanted to give you a heads up. One of my super chats was missing on Midnight Musings. The BBC Studios teams with Nice Media Studios to adapt C.J. Tudor bestseller The Chalk Man into a six-part TV series. As an avid reader, have you read this book, Bob? No. Uh, the Chalk Man. I have not, but um, uh, I've not read it, but The Chalk Man, now it's on my radar. So, Glenn Mark, thank you for that. I love when people uh, send me things. By the way, last night uh, somebody said to me, Rob, could you do short videos just like Rob's picks and just give us things that you like that you think we should read? I'm going to do that. I'm going to start making probably eight-minute videos so they can be monetized. Uh, eight-minute, eight to ten-minute videos of just my picks of things. And they'll be pre-recorded of like if you've never um, if you've never watched Star Trek, the original series before. I get this question all the time. What episodes should I start with? And maybe I'll just give you a top 10, probably from the first season, top my, Rob's top 10 first season original series episodes to start with as a, uh, cause I'm, I'm, I'm uh, shocked. Well, maybe not shocked, but how many people, especially young people write to me and go, hey, Rob, there's 700 and something episodes of Star Trek. It's so intimidating. Where do I start? And I always say, start with the original series. And I'm going to start doing that and just books, movies, and I'll probably shoot them from around the, uh, Rob's observatory. So I'm gonna be doing I'm gonna be doing that for you guys. So I'm gonna start doing that probably this week. Also, we're bringing back whining about movies. If you're new to the channel, my girlfriend Elizabeth and I here at the house, um, we 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 will watch a movie in our new movie room that I'm painting today because Zoe, her oldest daughter, moved out and got her own place in Hollywood. So we have an empty room that I'm turning into a home theater. I'm so I'm moving the TV out and turning it into a nice room, home theater room with the thunderous Dolby Atmos. Dolby Vision surround sound rock and roll up there. I'm painting that room today, I'm painting it a cool chocolate brown. It's going to look great. But um, we're going to bring back Whining About Movies where we watch a movie and then we share a bottle of wine as we discuss the film. And it's fun to do it with uh, Elizabeth. Our first movie that we're going to be doing this week, I believe it's going to be on Thursday, is Everything Everywhere All at Once. So that will be the first movie that we watch. Uh, Elizabeth's never seen it. We'll be watching it on 4K, of course, 4K disc. In our new movie room that will be finished painting today. So thanks for that, Glenmark. I'm sorry I missed your super chat. Apologies. Um, so yeah. Uh, Mensky. Mensky writes in and says, Hey Rob, I've been watching your recent Midnight Musings and saw you mention the Vader Sessions. <laughs> if you guys haven't seen the Vader Sessions, it's still one of the greatest YouTube videos ever made. Somebody... Some mad genius cut together scenes from Star Wars, but they put 
James Earl Jones' voice from other movies in Darth Vader's mouth. You just have to see it. It's it's kind of like The Matrix. You can't be told what The Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. The Vader Sessions, one of the oldest, greatest videos on YouTube. For 16 years, The Vader Sessions has stood as one of my favorite YouTube videos. In fact, way back in 2012, after the Blu-rays became available, I remastered it <laughs> with as close to frame-by-frame -frame accuracy as I could and using a higher quality version of the original SD video with better quality sound than originally available on ajac.com. I even managed to get hold of the original creator, Stephen Fraley, who gave his blessings. Sadly, on attempting to upload it to YouTube, it instantly got a copyright strike and the channel I uploaded it to didn't have the power to appeal. There is a version on Daily Motion, but it's not the greatest quality. I ended up editing a definitive version after that one, which hasn't really been shared anywhere. I wish I could share it with the PostGeek Singularity and beyond, but it seems my only option is dubious file sharing sites. But if you'd like it, let me know. Keep up the good work, uh, Mensky. Well, first of all, yes, the answer is yes, and I'll put it up on my own Vimeo page and in high def, and I'll just put out a link so everybody can enjoy it. If you've never seen the Vader Sessions, I'm going to put Mensky's link that he sent to me. Here it is in the live chat. Check it out. Check it out. If you haven't seen the Vader Sessions, you got to watch it. Uh, REG says, do they use Moriarty as a last resort to save them? Bro. Bro. Uh, why can you, why would, why would, I, I can't possibly answer that question for you. I mean, you know, maybe Benedict Cumberbatch comes back and plays Sherlock Holmes and they need Moriarty to like, you know, get past him because when they realize, wait a minute, isn't that guy Khan from an alternate universe? I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that. But um, you'll have to tune in and find out how Moriarty winds up in Star Trek Picard Season 3. Because you're not going to hear it cut away from me. Um, so there you go. But I guarantee you it'll put a smile on your face. God bless Terry Metalis for being able to do that. Um, I still like what Alexander Wilson said about sports events. Everybody can go and root for their team. It's true. It's true. Uh, Stubble McShave says, Concerning the last two episodes of Picard Season 3 in theaters, releasing the 10 episodes as scheduled on streaming, episodes 9 and 10 could be released in a cinema when 9 is streaming. Then people can't complain about pausing the streaming. Um, yeah, I mean, you could do something like that. Although, look, all you have to do is say, you know how they split up seasons? Like the you, you get like like Ozark season four part one and Ozark season four part two, all they have to do is call call the climax a, a movie, you know Picard the movie, and and say you can see and Picard the movie will stream. I mean they would never do this because they they there there's business concerns, there's contractual concerns, whatever, and nobody wants to lift a finger and do any of the work that they would have to do to pull something like that off. They don't want to do it, and I understand it. I mean I get it. I, but it would be cool if they did, and they should actually, because it's very satisfying. And I'm telling you, the way this show looks and the way it's mixed, the final two episodes, if I've seen them, but the final two episodes are dope. And the, I'm telling you, it's 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 theatrical through and through. I would actually do that because it would be it would be awesome. You want to bring some luster back to Star Trek? Put Picard seasons season three episodes nine and ten in a movie theater. And by the way, you've got eight episodes before to market it for you, and say you're going to put it out. It's a Star Trek event. Why not? Why not? You know, everybody wants to make your IP more valuable. It would certainly bring more eyeballs to the show than are looking at it now. Plus, you have to overcome the first two seasons. Why not? And aside from marketing dollars, I mean, your show itself is advertising. And and put it in IMAX theaters. Make it an IMAX event. I'd love to see some shit like that go down. Um, I would. Um, Mr. 47 says, did you pre-order the Bullet Train 4K Steelbook? I did, actually. I did uh, pre-order the Bullet Train 4K Steelbook. Uh, I've been getting more and more Steelbooks. Um, I got one yesterday. But I'll show it tomorrow on Let's Get Physical Media. Um, but yeah, it's good stuff. I uh, I really like Bullet Train, actually. I, I, I thought it was much better than I thought it was going to be. Pleasantly, definitely surprised. So, yeah. 
But by the way, thank you for Mensky for writing this um, this letter. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, kind souls, gentle beings, I'm going to bring an end to Rob's Observations episode 809. Um, oh, Roger Roger Green says or Grine says I I always forget. You told me how to pronounce your name, and I'm fucking it up again. Um, Roger says I recently bought the Lone Gunman on DVD. Love the show. Too bad it was cut short. There was some interesting Lone Gunman episodes. Again, I thought the tone of the show was kind of wonky, but I really like where it was going. I would like to have seen, you know, Chris Carter had an interesting run. I mean, Millennium, even though they tried to change the premise of the show for all three years, I, I really like what they what, where they were going. And I thought Lance Henriksen as Frank Black was just great. Just great. Um, so, yeah. Um, Medallion was talking about an Odyssey class ship, but it's the Enterprise F. I can assure you it is indeed the Enterprise F. You can see it right here. There's it says F right there on uh again, this is the Enterprise F from Star Trek Picard season three, the trailer. Uh and of course, you know, there's some really cool Starship porn. Uh here's the new space dock. Obviously it's like the old space dock, but it's much bigger. And then it has these sort of Franz Joseph designs and you can see all around space dock there's fireworks and stuff going off and there is what looks to be i don't know hundreds of starships i wonder what's going on there don't know huh. or do i i don't know but hey it looks cool so yeah and look at this i mean look at this group of people how excited are they to present their picard season three trailer at the new york comic con by the way jonathan frakes did direct episodes of picard season three um, so that's pretty cool. And, uh, it's Terry Metalis did a great job. And there he is in the back with his, with his, with his bed head. So go Terry. You did a great job. And, um, I'm a big fan. Let's take a look at that Titan. Titan A looks pretty dope. New constitution, Neo constitution class. I'm down. I want one. Uh, please somebody make a model of it. Cause Eagle Moss can't. Uh, Alexander Wilson goes on to say, I have to say, that 2021's Halloween Kills was one of the worst movies I've ever seen in the theater. How many times did they have to say, evil dies tonight? At the end of the day, my lady is going to drag me to see Halloween Ends. Please help me. Alexander Wilson, Halloween Ends, debuts on Peacock the same day it's in theaters. So you, you, you might not have to go see Halloween Ends. Look, I am no fan. I'm a Blumhouse fan. I think what they've done is great. I hated these new Halloween movies. And God bless Jamie Lee Curtis. Jamie Lee is getting paid. But I really hated those movies. Did not like them. Uh, which is kind of a bummer. Um, but I wanted to like them. Let's see. Why don't I read one more letter before I sign off. So you can all go watch the Star Trek Picard Season 3 trailer yet again. Um, now here's one from James Bond. He writes, Rob, this is a selfish plea. Get healthy. My favorite guy in the interwebs was Schnepp. He left us far too young. Snap out of it, Rob. Do keto for a few months, then get serious about it. Like Harrison Ford said, fish and vegetables. Yeah, you know, I can say that uh, I've uh, I've gained a little weight. Not, not as much as you might think, though. A lot of the weight I have is in my face, but I haven't gained that much weight. But you're right. Uh, that's why Octo Sober October is happening right now. But I appreciate, James, uh, you, you being worried about me. Uh, but you're right. I can always look. I could lose 50 pounds and look all svelte like I looked in high school, but that would take a lot of work. But I want to do it because I want to live long, uh, live a long time. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate your concern. It is it is definitely uh, taken in the spirit it was intended, and um, definitely want to do that. So there you go. Um. No, I, you know what? I've got to go through. There's there's so many. Oh, this is a good one. I kind of like this one. This is an interesting one. Ian, Pod Racing Palpatine, says this letter is titled The Mandela Effect. Hello, Rob and Dietz and all in the chat. Uh, I'm going to read this because we read it before, but I'm going to read it again. I'm having a Mandela Effect regarding Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. I clearly remember a scene near the end of the movie with a Vulcan child uttering some words to Spock as he was taken up Mount Salea. She is mentioned in the film's credits and does appear in the comic book and, if memory serves, the novel. Does this footage exist or am I just dreaming? Thanks for all that you do. Here's looking forward to celebrating the 25th year of the greatest movie I saw in L.A. in 1999, Free Enterprise. That's actually going to happen 
in 2024, but 2023 was when we played at festivals. But hopefully I'll be able to get it out in 4K next year. That'd be great. Well, thanks for that. Now, that people have asked, I, I uh, don't know. Oh, Elizabeth says that you can't see my face. Did I not go back to my face? What are you looking at? What did I what, what did I what did I leave you with? What are you looking at on the stream? Well, it's cool, right? It's the enterprise. So I've been just yammering away so you can't see me. See, I get so caught up in what I'm doing. I don't I don't go back. Well, thanks Elizabeth. Thanks, babe. Uh for doing that. But hey, you know what? I just wanted to leave the enterprise up just cuz it's I, I probably that's not the enterprise. That's the Titan A. Uh, I was thinking Constitution class. I was thinking enterprise, but you know, it wasn't the enterprise F. That's the Titan A. This is the Enterprise F. Let's be clear. There you go. Uh, Titan A, Enterprise F. All these, all these letters. It's, it's tough. But so now, um, there was a child at the end of Star Trek II. Khan had a baby. And that was shot. And people have seen pictures of that. I don't know. It might have been in the script that there was a child in Star Trek III. But maybe I could ask Mark or something, Altman. They're in Sidious right now presenting their 1982 documentary, but I don't think so. I don't think that they ever shot that child. They might have, but off the top of my head, I don't actually know. I know that they did. There's pictures of the baby at the end of Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, but I'm not really sure about the rest. Uh, anyway, good question, though. Uh, you know, I feel that way, too. The Mandela effect, I, I, I was convinced, and I still believe this, I remember Biggs being in Star Wars the first time I saw it back in 1977. The exchange, I've got some crazy stories to tell you. Save them for when we get back. I'm convinced that when I first saw Star Wars, and it was, when Star Wars opened, it only opened in like 35 theaters, and Seattle was one of the theaters. And there was different soundtracks, and they might have replaced the print. I don't know. But I think that that was in the movie. I believe that was in the movie. I could be wrong. By the way, uh, Terrier uh, had said early. Uh, early on that that he thought um free enterprise was the greatest movie ever made thank you terry i appreciate that jason s says ghostbusters 2016 flopped and hollywood blamed men bros flops and hollywood blames men and straights why does hollywood consistently trash talk their customer base when everyone can stream all of their stuff for free on third-party websites why fund hatred well i'll tell you why because movies are really expensive and when somebody makes a movie that they've gone to bat for and it completely tanks, they're always looking for somebody else to blame. So they can place the blame on somebody to save their own skin. It's shitty. But unfortunately, that's why um, uh, that's why movies are that way. And, and they, they um, it's, a, it's a bummer that, look, uh, you have to assume responsibility. If a movie fails, there's a lot of reasons that a movie can't doesn't usually do well at the box office. In the case of The Shawshank Redemption, it did not do well at the box office. The movie was called The Shawshank Redemption, and it had Andy Dufresne's hands outstretched as he was in the rain. Nobody knew. I don't even think it said on the poster, or they were billing it as a Stephen King story, because people thought at the time, idiots, didn't understand that movies like Stand By Me and Misery, I mean, Misery was a Stephen King story, but Stand By Me was based on the same book uh, uh, the novella came from the same book that Shawshank Redemption came from and they didn't say based on the beloved story by Stephen King they didn't even do that and the way Shawshank Redemption was marketed was a complete and utter failure and um it, it obviously is one of the most beloved films of all time which is is a bummer but and so when movies fail everyone looks because heads will roll you know, if you're at a studio and you've greenlit a movie, if you championed a film that gets made and it completely tanks the box office, that's you. You know, and really in Hollywood, the 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 adage is you're only as good as your last project, and unfortunately, that's true. And if something doesn't make money, it's uh it's bad. It's a bummer. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, gentle beings, kind souls, however you identify across these the 28 known galaxies, I am bringing episode number 809 of Rob's Observations to a close now before i do that i want to check and make sure i get everybody i'm all caught up roger also goes on who asked about the lone gunman says i also bought the original nosferatu and the Werner herzog version of nosferatu on disc interested in which in which version i would like more good question i mean how many decades apart are they and um i liked uh uh 
Herzog, the Klaus Kinski version of Nosferatu. And I like the original. And of course, they're now remaking it with the young young stars Skarsgård who played uh, Pennywise in It. So that's cool. Um, I want to thank my moderating staff. I want to thank Justin Toner. I want to thank Tom Jr. Jackson for moderating this chat, uh, jumping on this sort of unannounced chat. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank all of you for generously supporting this channel via Super Chats and tips. It is much appreciated. And memberships. And as I said, if you want to become a channel member tomorrow, we are having a member chat at 1 p.m. Uh, I will send out the link for that member chat today, probably right after I get off the show. And uh, I will see you at 1. For those of you who have never been on a member chat, how it works is we all get in <clears throat> via Zoom into the membership chat. So we get to see everyone's lovely face if you're shy. You don't have to show your face. You can just hang out. People raise their hands, and we take first come, first serve. And, and people, you get 10 minutes to say your piece, ask me a question, talk amongst yourselves, <coughs> tell me about your day. What's really fun in the membership chats is some people have kids, and some of them, have, one of our members has a, a, a son that went into the military and became a Black Hawk helicopter pilot, and he's been a member of the channel while all that has happened, even during COVID and the pandemic and all that. So we actually get to hear about people's lives, which is very cool. And again, if you want to write me letters right there below me, right down there, postgeeksingularity.com, you can go to the website, postgeeksingularity.com. I know we haven't updated it in a long time, but you can still send me letters, and I will get them, and I will read them on this show. And uh, it's free of charge, just if you keep the letters short. We had to, we were getting these, these tomes that we had to be like, you have to pay. <laughs> but if it's 500 words or less, send me a letter, and uh, um, I'd love to hear from you. But again, tomorrow... We will be chatting tomorrow. Uh, a membership chat. The Zoom. The Zoom link will go out today, and uh, we'll chat. We'll chat after Dieter and I do. Uh, Let's get physical media tomorrow at 11 a.m. There might be a show tonight. I don't know. We might do another show tonight. Uh, everybody, go and watch that Star Trek trailer. Go and watch it, and um, I think you're gonna like it. It's on YouTube. Star Trek Picard, New York Comic Con trailer. And uh, it's very dope. And on that note, remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I would say to all of you, have a better day. <laughs>